Hey folks, nice to see you, thanks for coming. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about um, this concept that is behind the, the book. The book is called Trade-Off, Why Some Things Catch On and Others Don't. And the, the central you know, piece, the central engine of this is, is some, the trade-off. Now, the tra I want to introduce you to a couple of words that are important as we go through this. So one of those words is fidelity. It's a word I use a lot in the book. Now, we're not talking about some of the you know, usual stuff. We're not talking about like, you know, staying with your you know, spouse for all these years and that kind of fidelity. We're not talking necessarily about you know, music fidelity and having that, you know, although there's a little bit of a mix of those things together. Um, what we're talking about with fidelity is um, the total experience of something. And um, so that includes not just how good or how good the quality is of something, but also um, the, the sort of how it makes you feel and, and being able, what it lends to your identity by being able to tell friends about the fact that you use that or you have that product or that you went to that concert or you did this, did this particular service. So it's really fidelity is the total experience of something. The second word, and these all come into play as we go along here, the second word is convenience. And by convenience, not necessarily mean just, you know, 7-Eleven down in the corner being a very, you know, a convenience store. Doesn't necessarily mean, you know, TV dinners is something that's very convenient. I mean, these are factors in it. But all in all, I want you to think about convenience, the word convenience, as just very broadly how easy it is to get or do something. And that includes how ubiquitous it is, that includes how um, easy it is to get or to use it. It also includes the cost, because if something costs not very much, it's easier for more people to get. So those are the two basic words. Now, um, and, and the sort of engine behind the book is this idea that all of us, we constantly in our everyday lives, um, we, we constantly make these trade-offs between the fidelity of something or that great experience of something and the convenience of getting it. So we're willing to do something that's very inconvenient, that's high fidelity or very high fidelity but low convenience. And I'll explain all of that in a second. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about where this book came from. Um, how many of you are, are, are Netflix users and fans? A lot of Netflix fans. Not, actually, not as many as I expected. Um, OK, so this is the CEO of Netflix. There's a guy named Reed Hastings. He's actually one of the most interesting, innovative managers in all of technology in Silicon Valley. Um, and in 2005, I went to a, con a, a conference in um, San Francisco called Web 2.0. It was um, right at the height of sort of the echo boom of, of, the, uh, of the internet. And went to this, you know, it was like 5,000 people packed in this little uh, hotel conference area. And, and Reed was up on stage and he was speaking about how he runs his company and the ideas behind how he uses, um, how he makes decisions. And he started talking about this idea that he constantly watches the trade-off between fidelity and convenience that his, um, that his users are, are willing to make. And this was um, surrounding the idea of why, why didn't Netflix at that point in time, in 2005, offer movies over the internet yet. They just still stuck with the DVDs that they were sending by mail that you guys are, those red envelopes you guys are familiar with. Um, and, uh, and, and his reason was that he didn't feel that um, the experience of of uh, trying to use the internet, even though it might be more convenient because it was right there all the time, the experience of using it, the fidelity of using it was so bad because of all the software glitches, the DRM that was attached, the fact that the, internet's, the internet didn't work so well for most people, that it wasn't worth the trade-off for most of his customers, so he, wasn't, he was still sticking with those red envelopes and the DVDs. But when Reed said this on stage, um, now, I'd been writing about technology and interviewing all sorts of people for 15, 20 years before that. And Reed said this on stage, and it was kind of this funny thing, like, all of a sudden, um, these little dominoes in my head started clicking together of, of things that people had told me over the years. I'd had similar conversations just like this, but with people using different kinds of language and talking about it in slightly different ways. Um, I remember a conversation with a guy named Trip Hawkins, who was the founder of Electronic Arts. Um, and he started a new uh, cell phone gaming company called Digital Chocolate, and he, he said pretty much the same, same thing when he was talking about why he thought that Digital Chocolate was the new kind of gaming company for cell phones. Um, I ended up having this conversation with Steve Jobs when he was at Next Computer during his years when he was 
kind of ousted from Apple. Um, and he was talking about these trade-offs people were willing to make. But again, in different language and different ways. Um, I had this conversation with a guy named Mark Porat, who started this company in 1994 called General Magic, um, that at the time before the internet really sort of existed in the form we know today, General Magic had kind of envisioned all of what the internet was supposed to be and sort of had this idea it was going to build it all itself. The company didn't actually go anywhere. Um, and I even remembered um, a lot of research I'd done about the Razor cell phone. And, what, uh, and, and the reason that the Razor was such a huge success in the beginning and ended up dropping like a, a rock in, and now is like a brand that is not that, you know, that well liked or well thought of. And I'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later. But all these things and it, many others sort of like kind of rushed into my head and made me think there's a big idea here. I really you know, want to explore this. Um, and so I started talking to um, lots of people out in business and in technology and um, started realizing that, that there's a kind of a chart you can make about how this trade-off works. So you see on one side over here is this idea of fidelity and on the other side this idea of convenience. And so if you're you know, willing to make a, a, you know, a trade for something that's high up on that fidelity end, um, and it, it can be very inconvenient and you're still willing to do it. Now here's an example of how it works in music. So let's take a U2 rock concert. Going to, going to a U2 concert is a super high fidelity experience. You know, you get, you get the music, you get the lights, you get the show, you get the people all around you, you get to tell your friends you went. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's an all-encompassing high fidelity experience. It's also over on that end of the chart because it's extremely inconvenient to go to a U2 concert. You know, it costs a lot, you have to put up with parking, you have to listen to Bono prattle on about world hunger and things like that. So it's really, you know, <laughs> very inconvenient thing to have to do. But the thing is that up in that corner, up in that high fidelity, low convenience corner, those concerts sell out all the time. So that's doing really well, even despite what's happening in music, despite what's happening in the economy. There's another end of music that's doing really well, and that's out here. MP3 music files, iPod, iTunes, all of that is the extreme end of convenience in music. You know, it's very easy to use, it's very easy to get, it's very low cost. Um, and at the same time, it's out here because it's extremely low fidelity. Um, the, the quality of the sound of an MP3 file is actually like 10 times worse than the sound on a compact disc, but you're willing to put up with it because it's so convenient. It'll fit in your pocket, 10,000 songs, 20,000 songs, whatever, and it's cheap, it's easy. Uh, there's one thing that is not doing really well in music right now, and that's the compact disc. The compact disc falls in this zone over here, which is actually neither very much fidelity or very much convenience. And it turns out, as you apply this model to product after product, industry after industry, you see that what ends up happening is products that are very high fidelity and very high convenience tend to be the ones that excite people the most. And products and services that fall into this zone in the middle where it's kind of like not much one of not much of another tend to invoke a lot of consumer apathy and there's brand confusion and those things don't tend to do quite as well. Now, what's up in that upper right hand corner? Well, you know, the super high fidelity, super high convenience. Um, well, the only thing I could think of in this particular model was having Bono perform in your living room. Um, if you're the President of the United States, I guess you can do that. But um, not exactly a very good business model for you, too. Not a very sustainable thing to do. So we're going to talk about a little bit about why that place on this chart doesn't work in a moment. <laughs> 